Lester Brown whirled on the edge next on Enviro Close Up. Welcome to Enviro Close Up. I am Carl Grossman with Lester Brown, founder and president of the Earth Policy Institute and the author of a brilliant new book, World on the Edge, How to Prevent Environmental and Economic Collapse. Welcome, Lester Brown. Thank you, Carl. Lester, let me start off with the last line of World on the Edge. The choice will be made by our generation, but it will affect life on Earth for all generations to come. What's the choice? The choice is that our civilization is facing the need for a massive course correction. Um, we, if we want to protect civilization and, and to see it survive more or less as we know it, then we've got to think about how to stabilize climate, how to stabilize population, and how to do both of them rather quickly. Um, and that's a major undertaking. We also have to think about how to eradicate poverty because that interacts so directly with efforts to stabilize world population. And then we have to, we have to launch an international effort to protect the economy's natural support systems, its forests, its grasslands, its soils, its aquifers, its fisheries. We are now in the process of destroying each of these. Forests are shrinking, fisheries are collapsing, uh, water tables are, are falling as aquifers are depleted and so forth. No civilization has ever survived the ongoing destruction of its natural support systems, nor will ours. And we don't have much time. That's why it's up to us. This is not something we can, we can leave to the next generation. Unless we can get these trends turned around soon, civilization as we know it is in trouble. And in the book, you say it's years, not decades, that we're talking about. That's right. For example, with climate change, the political leaders in the, the, the conference in Copenhagen a year or more ago um, talked about um, cutting carbon emissions 80% by 2050. But we think we're going to have to cut carbon emissions 80% by 2020. This is the sort of effort we think it will take if, for example, we want to have a chance at saving the Greenland ice sheet. And I use the Greenland ice sheet as sort of a metaphor for civilization because if we can't save the Greenland ice sheet, we're looking at a rise in sea level of 23 feet. Imagine, if you will, what the east coast of the United States would look like with a 23-foot rise in sea level. I don't think civilization could withstand the stresses associated with that kind of sea level rise. I mean, imagine the hundreds of millions of rising sea refugees around the world. Imagine the, the need to re relocate many of the world's largest coastal cities simply because they otherwise would be, uh, would be well underwater. Shanghai is only a meter to a uh, above sea level. New York and London are not far behind. So this is, this is why the, there's such an urgency in dealing with, the, with these issues. Time is not on our side. Time is running out. Um, nature is, is the timekeeper here. Nature sets these thresholds beyond which we can't, we, we, we can't reverse things, like the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. Nature's the timekeeper, but we can't see the clock. And global warming caused not by nature, but by people. It's the issue in how you begin the book in Moscow in 2010 with the extraordinary heat wave that decimated the grain harvest in, in Russia. If, if someone had told me a year ago, um, that is in, in, the, in early 2010, that there was going to be a heat wave in Moscow and, and the temperature um, during the month of July could average 14 degrees Fahrenheit above the norm, 
I, I would have rejected. I would have said, you know, I'm not a climate denier, but that's, that's off the chart. That's, that's not a realistic expectation. But it happened. And not only did it happen, it caused extraordinary damage in, in Russia. I mean, as, as everyone knows, Western Russia was burning from, uh, from uh, starting in late June through July and into early August. By the time it got to early August, things were so hot and so dry that there were three or four hundred new fires starting every day. And, and Russia was simply not able to cope with it. In the end, um, that, that heat wave cost um, cost Russia something like $300 billion. It did three times as much damage as, as Katrina, for example. But in a sense, the world was lucky because if that heat wave had been centered not in Moscow, where it reduced the Russian grain harvest from 100 million tons to 60 million tons, if it had been centered in Chicago, and the U.S. grain harvest had been reduced by 40 percent, the world would have lost not 40 million tons of grain, but 160 million tons of grain, 40 percent of our 400 million ton grain harvest. If that had happened, world grain stocks would have dropped to the lowest level in history, the lowest level on record. This would have created chaos in world grain markets. As, as prices literally went off the top of the chart for grains and for food more broadly, we would have seen grain exporting countries beginning to restrict exports in order to keep their domestic food prices down. Just as Russia um, in the summer of 2010 after the, after the heat wave um, totally banned exports and it had been a leading wheat exporter just um, the year before that. Um, the, the next thing that would have happened is that in this um, world of rapidly tightening grain supplies, the oil exporting countries that import grain, which is most of them, would have started bartering oil for grain in order to make sure they got the grain they needed. And that would then have left many other grain importing countries, particularly low Low, lower income grain importing countries with almost um, nothing to, uh, uh, to, uh, to tap, no place to go for imports. Instead of watching smoke in Moscow and fires in Russia, we would have been watching food riots uh, on a scale we've never seen before. We would have been watching uh, one government fall after another as they were not able to respond to, um, to the, their people's food needs. I mention this just to give a sense of how close to the edge we are. And indeed, the reason I entitled the book World on the Edge is because I think we're much closer to the edge than most people realize. You speak about the food bubble bursting, and indeed, you note it has burst in places around the world already. We have in many countries now, in fact, a total of 18 that we've identified, a situation where in the effort to expand food production and expand irrigation, countries have moved into a situation where they are over-pumping their aquifers. Um, aquifers are underground water uh, reserves. Most of them replenished naturally through rainfall. but. What's happening now is that in many countries, these aquifers are being pumped much faster than they're recharging. So they're gradually being depleted. When they are depleted, the rate of pumping is necessarily reduced to the rate of recharge. And we saw this happen most dramatically in, in Saudi Arabia. After the oil export embargo in the 1970s, the Saudis realized they would be vulnerable to a grain counter export embargo because they were heavily dependent on imported grain. So using their oil drilling technology, they found an aquifer about a half mile down. Um, this happened to be a fossil aquifer, that is one that does not recharge. And they've been pumping that heavily for more than 20 years, and they have been self-sufficient in wheat production throughout this period. But then just a few years ago, they announced that that aquifer was largely depleted and they were going to have to phase out wheat production. As a result, 
In the last three years, Saudi wheat production has dropped by more than 70 percent. In another year or two, they'll be out of the wheat production business entirely. Now, this is a, a particularly dramatic example for two reasons. One, the Saudi, in Saudi Arabia, without irrigation, you, you really don't have agriculture. And in this case, they were pumping a fossil or non-rechargeable aquifer. So when it was depleted, that was the end. It's like pumping an oil field dry. When it's gone, it's gone. Um, but there are other countries, like Syria and Iraq, where, where over-pumping and aquifer depletion is also leading to declines in grain production. And in the Arab Middle East as a region, we're now, we're now looking at a situation where grain production has peaked, reached its historical peak, and be begun to decline because of water shortages. This is the first region where we've seen this. But the really big water bubbles in the world are not in these smaller countries. They're in India and China. In India, the World Bank reports that 175 million Indians are being fed with grain produced by overpumping, which by definition is a short-term phenomenon. And the big question is, when does the bubble burst in India, this water-based food bubble? And the answer is we don't know exactly. We do know that water tables are falling in almost every state in India because farmers earth have drilled 21 million irrigation wells, which is great for expanding production in the short run, but the overpumping means there will become some there will be coming some abrupt declines in the irrigation water supply as aquifers are depleted and pumping is necessarily reduced to the rate of recharge. In China, we have a similar situation where we estimate that 130 million Chinese are being fed with grain produced by overpumping. So we have this situation with water-based food bubbles now in some 18 countries around the world that contain over half the world's people. And very few people are aware of this. I mean, some water specialists at the World Bank know about it and a scattering of other people, but most people do not. Most of the economists who work on world food projections do not know what's happening to the, uh, the world's underground water resources and how their depletion is going to affect future food production trends. You're right in the book, too, Lester, about the world economy expanding some 20-fold over the last century, but you say revealed has been a flaw so serious that if it is not corrected, it'll spell the end of civilization as we know it, the flaw being indirect costs, and you specifically focus on gasoline. Yeah, we, uh, we, we have an, an economy that's based on the market, and the market's a remarkable thing in so many ways. It allocates resources with an efficiency that central planners couldn't hope to match. Um, it sets prices on its own. Um, the problem is the costs that the market incorporates in prices are only the direct costs. For example, in a, a gallon of gasoline, the market will incorporate the costs of discovering and pumping the oil in, in transporting it to a refinery, uh, um, refining it into gasoline and, and then getting it to the local service station. But they do not incorporate the indirect costs, the costs of um, climate change, for example. They, don't, they do not include the cost of the U.S. military presence in the Middle East to, to guard our access to uh, oil resources. They do not include the cost of treating respiratory illnesses of people who breathe the polluted air um, uh, from burning gasoline. And so if you look at these indirect costs, then a gallon of gasoline in the United States costs not, say, $3, but $12. And by omitting these indirect costs, um, we, we have created a false sense of security and a feeling that gasoline is cheap. Gasoline, in fact, is very expensive. The question is, who pays the full cost? And if we do not, then the next generation will in, in terms of trying to cope with, with climate change. So the, 
The challenge is to get the market to tell the truth. And we're now in a situation where um, it is missing the mark badly on, um, on telling the truth. The challenge is to get the market to be honest. And that means restructuring the tax system to incorporate those indirect costs. For example, uh, we can lower income taxes and raise the carbon tax. Um, we won't change the amount of tax we pay, but we will increase the price of carbon, i.e. gasoline or coal or what have you, to reflect its real costs to society, not just the, the direct cost. If we can do that, then the world economy will begin to restructure itself. The challenge is to get the market to tell the truth. And I would quote here uh, a longtime Norwegian friend who at one time was the vice president of Exxon for Norway in the North Sea. He said, uh, back in the 90s, he said, he said, socialism collapsed because it did not allow the market to tell the economic truth. Capitalism may collapse because it does not allow the market to tell the ecological truth. And that, I think, sums up a rather profound point that the world's economists are, are missing. On the subject of energy, you have a big chapter on building an energy efficient global economy, followed by a major chapter on harnessing wind, solar, and geothermal energy. Could you elaborate on your plan, both in terms of efficiency and implementing these renewable energy technologies? If you're interested in efficiency, in energy efficiency, this is a great time to be alive because we have so many new technologies now coming on the market. If we look at lighting, for example, which is a major use of electricity um, around the world, uh, we grew up with incandescent light bulbs developed by Thomas Edison a century or so ago, and, and they really haven't changed that much since. It's the same basic design. But now we have compact fluorescent bulbs that will provide the same amount of lighting but use only one-fourth as much electricity. But beyond that, we now have LEDs, light-emitting diodes, that are still more efficient. And, and they will provide the same amount of light as, as a, an incandescent with scarcely 10% of the electricity use. So we now have this extraordinary potential for reducing the amount of electricity used for lighting. Even without going to LEDs, just going to compact fluorescents across the board, we can close 705 of the world's 2,400 coal-fired power plants. Um, I mention that as, as an example of the potential we now have with existing technologies, technologies already on the market. Another example would be transportation. Um, we all grew up with the internal combustion engine, which was a great idea, it seemed, uh, when it was first developed a century or so ago. But internal combustion engines are inherently inefficient they produce mostly heat, not power. They produce so much heat that we have to have cooling devices on them or they literally will burn up and, and, and be useless. But what we also now have is the possibility of cars with electric motors. Electric motors are, are three times as efficient as gasoline engines. So moving from um, internal combustion engines either to hybrid plug-ins or to all-electric cars provides an enormous potential for increasing the efficiency of our transport system. Likewise, if we have rail systems that are driven um, with electricity, we can be running our cars and our, and our railroads, our urban rail systems, for example, on electricity generated from wind farms. And the exciting thing about this is that the, the um, electricity equivalent of a gallon of gasoline, uh, if it comes from a wind farm, costs the equivalent of 87 cents a gallon. So the economics are beginning to fall into place as well. So we have the technology and the economics. What we now need are the policies uh, like restructuring taxes, 
um, like providing incentives to, uh, to uh, cut carbon emissions and save energy that will accelerate this shift toward a far more um, energy efficient world economy. That's one way of dramatically cutting carbon emissions. The other way is to move away from um, coal and oil and natural gas to wind and solar and geothermal energy. In the United States, for example, we have enough harnessable wind energy in North Dakota, Kansas, and Texas to satisfy national electricity needs and not even come close to, to realizing their full potential. The state of Texas now has over 10,000 megawatts of wind generating capacity. It has the potential for nearly 50,000 megawatts, which would satisfy virtually all the electricity demand in, in Texas for the 24 million people that live there. The exciting thing is the sheer abundance of renewable energy. The Chinese, incidentally, have launched a program which um, includes building seven wind mega complexes, that is, vast wind farms, um, each of which would have a generating capacity of 10 to 30,000 megawatts. That's equal to 10 to 30 coal-fired power plants. But these seven complexes all together add up to about 130,000 megawatts um, of electrical generating capacity. That's equivalent to the Chinese building another coal-fired power plant every week for the next two and a half years. And this is a program they've already launched. They're beginning construction on these uh, huge wind farms now. I mentioned that as an example. Another example is, is solar energy. In, in July, before the November meeting in, uh, in Copenhagen a, a year or two ago, a group of European corporations led by um, uh, Munich Re, Munich Reinsurance, Reinsurance, Deutsche Bank, Siemens, and a number of others, announced a plan that they called their Desert Tech proposal. Desert with EC on the end, Desert Tech. And that proposal was to develop and incorporate the solar resources of North Africa into a European North African grid. This would integrate the rich solar resources of North Africa with the abundant wind resources of the North Sea into a single um, energy um, uh, system. The exciting thing about this, again, is the potential. The Algerians point out that in their desert, which is most of the country, they have enough harnessable solar energy to power the world economy. That almost sounds like a mistake, but it's, this point appears in the energy literature when it's noted that the sunlight striking the earth in one hour um, represents enough energy to run the world economy for one year. Um, so the, the exciting thing is the sheer abundance of wind energy or solar energy. China, for example, has 16 times as much harnessable wind energy, wind electricity, as its current total electricity consumption. Again, these resources are for all practical purposes, practical purposes unlimited. The challenge is for us to devise the systems to harness these energy sources to meet um, world energy needs. Now it's quite noticeable in that chapter on harnessing wind, solar, and geothermal energy it comes up on the second page that you don't believe that nuclear power would play a role in your plan B. Um, one of the things I do in evaluating energy sources is to look at Wall Street and see what it's doing. Wall Street is investing billions in wind energy and in solar energy. Wall Street has not invested in a nuclear reactor for more than 30 years. And there's a reason for that. They don't think they're economic. And, and that's the basic answer to the question. Nuclear is simply not competitive with these new energy sources. Um, if we had full cost accounting of nuclear power, imagine what it would embody. If, for example, we insisted that a utility wanting to build a nuclear reactor would bear the cost of disposing of the waste, would bear the cost of insuring the reactor against a possible accident. And the, the third major cost is decommissioning nuclear power plants. 
decommissioning them may cost as much as building them in the first place. So if you incorporate all these indirect costs, the cost of insuring reactors against an accident, the cost of disposing of the waste, of the nuclear waste generated by the reactors um, uh, as well, then we have a situation uh, where nuclear simply doesn't get out of the starting blocks. Um, it's, it's, it's not competitive. And, that, and that's, that's why we're not seeing um, many, if, uh, if any, nuclear power plants being built without subsidies in, in market situations. You are stressed, too, that it will have to be done with a wartime footing. You point to the mobilization in World War II as an example of the kind of intense activity that's needed. Yes. Um, we're faced with many scarce resources, but none as scarce as time. We have very little time in which to turn the situation around. And when I realize how much we have to do and how quickly we have to do it, I go back and reread the economic history of World War II. There, there was the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which from a military point of view was extraordinarily successful. I mean, they sunk a good part of the U.S. Pacific Fleet that was at anchor in Pearl Harbor on that Sunday morning, December 7, 1941. On January 6, 1942, one month later, President Roosevelt gave the State of the Union address in which he laid out U.S. arms production goals. He said, we're going to produce 45,000 tanks, 60,000 planes, and a, and a few thousand ships. People were blown away by these numbers. They couldn't imagine producing arms on this scale. But what Roosevelt and his colleagues realized at the time was that when the war was beginning, the largest concentration of industrial power in the world was in the U.S. automobile industry. So after his State of the Union address, he called in the leaders of the, of the automobile industry and said, because you guys represent such a large share of our industrial capacity, we're going to rely heavily on you to help us reach these arms production goals. And they said, well, we're going to do everything we can, Mr. President, but it's going to be a stretch producing cars and all these arms, too. He said, in effect, he said, you don't understand. We're going to ban the sale of private cars in the United States. And that's e exactly what happened. And the automobile industry had no option but to move into arms production. And within a matter of months, we were producing tanks on, Chrysler was producing tanks on assembly lines. Um, and before long, Ford was producing B-24 and later B-29 bombers on its huge assembly plant, one of its huge assembly plants in, in Michigan. I mean, we totally restructured the U.S. industrial economy, not in decades, not in years, but in a matter of months. And in the end, we exceeded every one of those arms production goals. We didn't produce 60,000 planes. We produced 229,000 planes. I was flying into Seattle on a, on a book tour not too long ago. And I was thinking of Boeing, um, which is, has its huge production facilities there. And, and I, I was thinking, 229,000 planes? Even today, it's difficult to imagine that. But we did it. And if we did it then, we can certainly restructure the energy economy today. Now, you're right that one of the questions I hear most frequently is, what can I do? What can people do? What could and should viewers of this program do? When I'm asked this question, as I frequently am in traveling around the world, um, I think people expect me to say, well, change your light bulbs and recycle your newspapers and, and so forth. And those things are important. But we're now in a situation where we have to change the system. Um, and, and by that, I mean we have to restructure the global economy. And that's going to require a restructuring of the tax system, the lowering income taxes and raising carbon taxes, for example. And we all have a stake in this. We environmentalists have for decades been talking about saving the planet. But as I think about it, the planet's going to be around for some time to come. The question is, will civilization as we know it survive the mounting stresses on it? 
from climate change to food shortages to failing states and so forth. This is the real question. And, and we now have to move quickly to change the system. That means picking an issue that's important to you, like closing coal-fired power plants, for example. And we've closed, uh, we're in the process of closing many and many more are slated for closing. And it's almost impossible to get a license now to build a new coal plant in the United States. So we're moving on that front, but we're not there yet. We haven't closed all the existing coal-fired power plants. So join the movement in your community to close your local coal-fired power plant and have it replaced with wind and geothermal and solar energy, for example, and efficiency. Or go to work to develop a world-class recycling program in your community where you recycle not 20 or 30 percent of the waste with the rest going to landfill, but where you recycle 70 or 80 or 90 percent of the waste with very little going to landfill. What most people don't realize is that an efficient and effective recycling program saves enormous amounts of energy and greatly reduces pollution. So it's a win-win situation. So we need to get involved politically. We need to let our elected representatives on the city council in Washington know what our concerns are and what we expect of them in, um, in, in trying to basically save civilization. Saving civilization is not a spectator sport. We all have to get involved. Les, thank you for being with us on Enviro Close Up. Carl, thank you very much. I've enjoyed our chat. And thank you for watching. This has been Carl Grossman. Visit our website, envirovideo.com, to check out this or any Enviro close up program.